Good afternoon. My name is Alan Detloff, and I'm very proud and honored to be Dean of the Graduate College of Social Work at the University of Houston. And today I'm very happy to welcome you to the second event in our three-part series, Eyes on Abolition, in which we're exploring abolition as a vision, abolition as practice, and abolition as a critical framework to bring about change, and specifically as a framework to address the racial violence, the racial disparities, and the tragic racist outcomes that we continue to see in our carceral systems. We often think of carceral systems as being the prison industrial complex and the criminal punishment system that's designed to maintain the prison industrial complex, but the carceral state is much larger than that. Our carceral systems also include the family regulation system, sometimes referred to as child welfare or child protective services, and the family detention system or immigration and customs enforcement. Today we're going to look at each of those systems and we're going to look at them through the lens of the harm they cause. If you joined us for our first event last week with Dr. Ruth Wilson Gilmore, you heard Dr. Gilmore describe abolition as a way of seeing. She said, abolition makes you ask when you look, what are you seeing and what would you rather see? What we see now when we look at our carceral systems are systems that disproportionately surveil black and brown bodies and black and brown communities, systems that forcibly separate black and brown children from their parents, and systems that lock people in cages as a means of resolving problems, whether those cages are prison cells, detention centers, or foster homes. So today we're going to explore this further and we're going to talk about what we'd rather see. And now I'm very happy to welcome Derricka Purnell, who is going to begin our conversation. Derricka Purnell is a human rights lawyer, writer, and organizer. She works to end police and prison violence by providing legal assistance, research, and trainings to community-based organizations through an abolitionist framework. As a Skadden Fellow, she helped to bid the, build the Justice Project at Advancement Project's national office, which focused on consent decrees, police and prosecutor accountability, and jail closures, providing community training, political education, and legal representation to organizers. Her advocacy efforts led to the dismissal of over 3,000 cases based on unconstitutional policing practices. Additionally, she supports several campaigns and grassroots organizations around the criminal legal system, electoral justice, and community investment, including Action St. Louis, Dream Defenders, Communities Against Police Crimes and Repression, the Ferguson Collaborative, and the Movement for Black Lives. Derricka also organized the founding steering committee for Law for Black Lives, a growing network of 5,000 law students, lawyers, and legal workers to support social movements. In the wake of the coronavirus pandemic, Derricka co-created COVID-19 Policing Project at the Community Resource Hub for Safety Accountability. This project tracks police arrests, harassment, citations, and other enforcement through public health orders related to the pandemic. Derricka received her JD from Harvard Law School, her BA from the University of Missouri, Kansas City, and studied public policy and economics at the University of California, Berkeley as a public policy and international affairs law fellow. Her writing has been published in the New York Times, The Guardian, The Appeal, Truth Out, Slate, Boston Review, Huffington Post, Vox, and In These Times. She's been featured on NPR, The Boston Globe, Slate's What's Next, and MSNBC, and is the former editor-in-chief of the Harvard Journal of African American Public Policy. Derek is currently a columnist at The Guardian and deputy director of Spirit of Justice Center at Union Theological Seminary. Derek, thank you very much for joining us today. Of course, thank you so, so much for the invitation. Thank you to the University of Houston and for everyone who's choosing to join in today to listen to this very, very, very important conversation. And so normally when I'm asked to talk about prison violence or police violence or prison abolition or police abolition, I'm usually summoned um, through my expertise, either as a lawyer, as an organizer, as an, or as a writer. But today I was invited to have a little bit different of a conversation. And part of that is related to my, my own personal experiences with what the Dean called the family regulation system. And so I'm gonna share a bit of my story and talk about how that informed part of my analysis around prison and police abolition. And then I will be excited to join other people in a panel, a panel discussion to hopefully dream about what's possible. So for a generation of new black activists, right, our calls to dismantle or to abolish the prison industrial complex didn't come from ignorance or dismissal or because we just had enough. It, that, was, that was not our entry into this work. It's quite the contrary. 
We spent more than a decade organizing within the confines of the criminal legal system. Many of us have launched movements for justice or against dehumanization and politicians or pundits or our parents or whoever else promised us that our peaceful protests and our appeals to the hearts and minds of people in this nation would set us free from oppression. We were promised and sold on what education could do, how education could potentially save us from the harms of ending, as my mom would always say, dead or in jail. And so we listened. Many of us pulled up our pants. We even cleaned our mouths. And we sought to prove how articulate we could be on camera or on panels or whenever we had an opportunity to speak about injustice. But the violence continued and it still continues. And that promise has been broken. And every time we witness another shooting, another racist incident, another tragedy, we realize that the system that we call broken was actually functioning exactly how it was intended. And so as activists, it's not that we needed to be in a position where we wanted to fix it, but we actually had to start refusing it and join the legacy and tradition and practices of abolitionists who have been doing this work for much longer than we have and decide what to do next. And so my own personal commitments to law and justice started really early at, at home. Um, my mom, since I was about four years old, she gave me two career options. She said that I could be a lawyer or I could be a doctor. And so my mom was neither. My mom didn't make it to college and she only really came across doctors if she was sick or came across lawyers in courts when she, if she was facing trouble. But at the end of the day, she set very, very high expectations for me, her first baby, to take on this noble career of public service. And she also made sure to tell me that I had to make enough money to buy her a house. So these are my goals entering kindergarten. And by then my mom was also introducing me to so many different black leaders, black activists, people who really paved the way for black people to achieve the American dream. So one of my nicknames is Booker Tucker after Booker T. Washington. And she will also call me her little Johnny Cochran. All right, so Johnny Cochran was the story black lawyer who defended O.J. Simpson during his infamous murder trial. So between the nicknames of Johnny Cochran and Booker Tucker, I almost had no choice but to become a lawyer. Um, around the same time is also when I realized that my family was poor. The, the, the word poor, poverty, and poverty, those words started entering my vocabulary very early. And so by the time I realized this, I was entering kindergarten and there was this kid, Joshua, in front of me. And we were in line and where I went to school in St. Louis, we had lunch tickets and the lunch tickets were shaped like the tickets at a carnival or the tickets you would get from Chuck E. Cheese without like the big giant mouse, but these little carnival tickets. And so we were in line and I reached for a chocolate milk. This is very normal kindergarten behavior. And the lunch lady, Miss Sloan, stopped me from getting the chocolate milk, but she did not stop Joshua, who was standing in front of me. And when I tried to figure out why she stopped Joshua and why she didn't stop me, oh, no, rather, why she didn't stop Joshua and why she did stop me from getting the chocolate milk was because Joshua handed her quarters and I did it. And so I just assumed that I had to buy the chocolate milk and that the white milk was free. So the next day I came prepared. I grabbed the milk, I opened my little kindergarten palm and I showed her the quarters that I took from my grandmother. And that just threw off the entire food chain. There was so much order in how you supposed to drop your ticket, pick up your lunch, grab your milk. But I disrupted that because I had these quarters. And so my teacher who was standing nearby, she just kept reassuring me that I didn't have to pay for anything. She said, no, 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 you don't have to pay. Choose whatever milk you want. And Ms. Sloan, the lunch lady, couldn't deny me or anyone else for that matter, the sinful beverage. Later in telling, what, telling that story to my mom, we realized that Ms. Sloan was withholding special treats from children who were receiving free and reduced lunch. So free and reduced lunch is given to kids who are um, at or beneath the poverty level. So you don't have to pay for food. This is unfortunately, the poverty level is set so arbitrarily low that there are lots of kids who can't afford lunch anyway. And they actually end up with lots of um, school lunch debt. 
And so because my family, because our families were poor, only the kids at that school who were under Miss Sloan's watch could get the chocolate milk. And so this is how I'm starting to get a language for why wow, people are being treated differently just on the basis of how much their family makes, right? Even, even little kids. And so in this essay that I wrote called How to Be a Police Ab How I Became a Police Abolitionist, I, I gave other details of my childhood. And again, because my world was so small, I hadn't realized the relationship between the environment surrounding me because I hadn't really been anywhere else. So I just knew that, you know, there were gunshots regularly in my neighborhood. And for a lot of the kids suffer from nosebleeds and asthma attacks and allergic reactions. And so we were naturally trained to call 911 whenever there was a crisis. Very few people had cars, there were no hospitals, there was no clinics, very few people had health insurance. And so the ambulance became a way to treat everything from, again, gunshots to allergic reactions. And again, over time, I started realizing that our neighborhood was making us sick, that we were surrounded by so many environmental toxins that the industrial gas facility at one end of my block caused a set of huge explosions that actually led to one death because it triggered asthma attacks. And another end right across from my middle school, there was this man who owned a lot. And what he did on that lot was collect all of these World War II, II era military planes and equipment, and they were all exposed. So even today, if you go to Google Images and you look at my middle school, you can see a playground on one side of the street. And if you look directly across the street, you see these engines and these half open helicopters and these half open airplanes. So these were the conditions in which my environment, my neighborhood was situated. And so in addition to all of that, the neighborhood had a thriving business district at one point in history. And that entire business community was decimated because there was a highway put in place. So all of the black home businesses that were there are now gone. So economic opportunities are gone. The school is sitting across the street from a junkyard. There is Anheuser Busch that's producing beer and giving off this horrific yeast smell. There is a gas storage facility that is because of all of these accidents we're causing people to get sick, right? And so people are trying to manage and make a way out of no way. And so my mom, you know, when we were unable to manage the time, we just relied on our neighbors. My neighborhood was about half East African, half African American. And so we were getting platters of Ethiopian food and leftovers. And at some point we even started a tab at a Chinese restaurant. So when there wasn't a lot of support in our, from like institutionally, the neighbors stepped in and we all took care of each other. My mom, um, I think right as I was entering middle school, started to sell candy and snacks out of her house as another way to get income. And it was so important because for lots of kids, this was the only way that they can get money, right? Outside of either selling drugs or gambling or whatever they could do to find. And she was able to do that for so long. But then, you know, $5, $10, $15 here and there for kids who are becoming adults is just simply not enough money. And so what I noticed as I was entering elementary school and middle school, as I was moving out of kindergarten, was that the teachers and my peers were treated me differently because of my appearance, because of how I dressed. You know, so someone decided to call, um, to hotline my mother. That was the language that we use. I'm not sure how common or popular that is, or if that's just a St. Louis thing, but we say, okay, we're going to hotline someone to me. So we're going to call and report or say there may be abuse in the home. So the abuse that was associated with my family was given away because of my baggy clothes, right? And so someone decided that my mom, my family we were too poor to raise me and my siblings. And a social worker decided that after one visit, so she removes me and my siblings and we all go to our first foster home together, which is a biracial couple who's living near Ferguson, right out of St. Louis. And when we went into that house, there were at least six other kids who were there. And so I was confused and 
scared and concerned, but my mom promised me that it would be temporary and I, I believed her. And so the social worker, before she leaves, I overhear her arguing with the foster mom, the person who is supposed to be temporarily providing a safe harbor for my mom's poverty for me and my siblings. And they're arguing because some set of foster care payments were late. And so here I am, I, I now I'm like seven or eight years old. My eight year old mind is just so curious about how this woman could get money to take care of us when actually that's the only thing that my mom needed. And later I realized that so many families were receiving money to foster or regulate and it was becoming quite lucrative. And so this foster mother, she had, she just had it and she refused to take or keep you know, there were four of us who refused to keep the oldest two, and I was the oldest child. And so after a couple of weeks, my brother and I, we had to move to another foster home. So we moved to our second foster home. This was in the city. And there was another house, maybe six or eight more kids. And our very first night there, we were attacked. The foster parent wasn't there when my brother and I arrived. And so no one told us where to sleep. No one told us the directions. No one told us where to go or what to do. I'm about eight, he's about six. And so as it started to get late, uh, my brother and I, we found an empty bed and we decided to go to sleep. And I'm trying to do my best to comfort him because he's crying, he's also scared. Not only are we now not with my grandmother, we're not with my mom, we're not with our two younger siblings. They're just at a strange family's house. And now it's just the two of us. And he was terrified that he and I were gonna get separated again at, and that we were just subject to the whims of the social worker and the person whose home we were living in. And so we were awakened that night when Clemmy, the person who was fostering us, unscrewed a broom and started poking at us to wake us up. And then as we're waking up, she starts hitting us with this broom. And she's yelling and screaming. And we're obviously, I mean, we're kids. And so we're freaking out. We're in pain. We're trying to avoid the, the broom and protect ourselves. And she's, you know, by the time she comes down from hitting us with this broom, she says, boys and girls cannot sleep in the same room in this house. And this was our welcome to our second house. Okay, um, so the courts ultimately mandated that my mom complete a number of programs in order to get us back. And she did that. She, she was in every sort of parenting program that she needed to be in in order to win her children back. And after a few months, she was able to get two back. And after a year, she was able to get the remaining back. And then we went to her. Finally, we were able to go home and we explained to her, you know, what happened in the first house when we were forced to leave because of the money. And then in the second house, the way that we were attacked. So she is livid. She's upset. She's finding out about this story several months later because we could not come into contact with her. And then the one time that we did, our time together was so short, it's like an hour at a McDonald's and we didn't feel comfortable telling what happened in front of the social worker. So months later, she reported to the social worker and the judge and they just decided to defer to the disciplinary style of the foster parent. So I don't think anyone has to be a parent to imagine what it must feel like for one stranger to decide that you're unfit to be a parent for another stranger to then come pick up your children, tell you that they're leaving today, to take them to another family's house, people who you've never meet, never see, and they're responsible for raising a child. So black children, Native American children especially, have been forcibly removed from their homes since their first contact with Europeans at the inception of what became the United States of America. And by the time, fast forward, I got to law school, I started learning about this history and I was just horrified. One of the cases I read about was this Native American family who I believe they were living in South Dakota and the rate of re forced removals of their children was so high that they were afraid to send their kids to school. They were afraid to take their doctors, 
their kids to the doctors because any one thing was an excuse to just remove them from the house. So this particular family, in this court case that we studied, their kid had a toothache. And so they were trying to treat it at home, trying to treat it at home. I believe the boy was about four or five. And then over time, the boy developed a fever and the toothache turned into an infection. And the boy ended up succumbing to the infection and, and dying. So the parents are distraught. They have just lost their kid. And the first thing that happens to them is that they're prosecuted. And the judge shows sympathy, right? They show sympathy to the parents. Oh, we know that this is a mistake. This is horrible. But the parents were still convicted of manslaughter. After losing their child, now have to spend you know, time in jail because of the violence of the state and the forced removal of children from their homes. So when people are critical about abolitionists and their claims that we don't care about victims or safety, they often forget that we are also the victims of violence, either in our homes or through the state or through the many ways that the state sanctions it, including environmental violence in our communities, the decimation of economic opportunities, the segregation and the the divestment in our educational spaces, our schools, the policing, the prisons, we are vulnerable to it all the time. And since Ruthie Wilson Gilmore was here last time, I'm sure that she had to talk about racial capitalism because that is what undergirds the reasons for lots of contact between police, the families, and the family regulation system. For my family, right, it was poverty and my clothes gave me away. But for George Floyd, it was the alleged use of a counterfeit $20 bill. So the abolition of police and prisons and even the foster care system is not a project that happens in a vacuum or alone, but it includes the abolition of a society that thinks it needs those violent systems. It's about the abolition of inequality, the abolition of unnecessary violence. And so that's a part of my story. There's a much, I mean, there's so much more to fill in. You know, I'm really, really excited to learn from the panelists and see what sorts of research and experts that I can learn from to figure out how to better inform my abolitionist politics. So thank you so much for having me and giving me time to speak. And yeah, I look forward to the conversation. Thank you, Derica. Once again, we really appreciate you being with us today and sharing your experiences. Um, I, I know that you don't talk about this often, so so we really, really, really appreciate you sharing your experiences. You know, there's what I kept thinking as you were talking, there's a lot of conversation happening right now in the social work community on whether foster care causes harm to children. And there are researchers who are actively saying the research doesn't show that foster care causes harm. But the problem with that research is that it completely ignores the voices of the people who've actually been harmed by that system. Mm -hmm. So I really appreciate you sharing your story with us. I think another really profound thing that you said is how is it that a stranger can get money for taking care of someone else's child when all we needed was money? Exactly. Yes. That's what's wrong with the family regulation system and everything that it involves. Um, so I really appreciate you being here. Of course. Thank you so much. Now we're going to transition to the Q&A um, portion of our event. And joining Derica in this Q&A will be a panel of experts, each of whom has expertise in one of the carceral systems that we're talking about today, policing, family regulation, and ICE. And to moderate our panel, I'd like to welcome Jason Oliver. Jason Oliver is an educator and an organizer with BLM HTX, Image Noir Collective, who builds collaborative spaces in order to imagine and create more equitable communities where Black people can thrive. He also works with local and national organizations to fill multicultural and gender gaps in contemporary art history through Wikipedia edit-a-thons. Jason blogs at myhoustonevents.com and facilitates the Houston Afrofuturism Book Club, which gathers monthly to explore new worlds through Black speculative fiction. Jason, thank you very much for being with us today. Yeah, thank you for having me. It's, it's great to be here. Um, I'm really excited for this panel. And so today with our panelists, we want to continue the conversation on abolition by exploring the harms caused by carceral systems. Let's start with a definition. So carceral system is best understood as a comprehensive network of systems that rely at least in part on the exercise of state sanctioned physical, 
emotional, spatial, economic, and political violence to preserve the interests of the state. And I'd like to open by giving each panelist, well, actually first, let's, let's bring up our panelists. So I, have, um, so I have their bios here. So first, Jody Berger Cardoso is an associate professor at the University of Houston's Graduate College of Social Work. With over 15 years of clinical experience working with immigrant populations, her research examines how exposure to trauma and psychosocial stress before, during, and post-migration affects the mental health of Latino immigrants and their children. She ex examined the unique stressors associated with parenting and the context of deportation risk, trauma, coping strategies, and substance abuse, or substance use among unac unaccompanied migrant youth and the influence of immigration enforcement on mental health and academic outcomes of Latino youth. She works with human humanitarian organizations that provide legal and mental health services to immigrants, unaccompanied minor youth and refugees who have experienced trauma and has served as an expert witness in asylum and trauma and child trauma cases. Next, we have Leah Brown. Leah leads the Texas Civil Rights Project's quest to relieve Texas communities of hazardous policing, prosecution, judicial, prison, monitoring, and surveillance practices that ensnare masses of people in incessant webs of injustice. As director of criminal injustice reform, she manages the team executing this mission inside and outside of federal and local Texas courtrooms. A former public defender and international criminal legal aid provider, Leah serves as internal and external strategic thought partner on a broad range of substantive criminal and civil legal topics, as well as on community and movement lawyering, grassroots organizing, litigation, and trial advocacy tactics. Next, we have Kristen Weber. Kristen is the Director of Equity, Inclusion, and Justice at the Center for the Study of Social Policy where she leads the strategic vision for addressing equity internally at CSSP and provides external technical assistance to jurisdictions working to address racial inequities. She serves as a faculty member for Foster America, a fellowship program whose mission is to improve the lives of America's most vulnerable children by building a pipeline of leaders and innovators who will help transform child welfare systems. Most recently, Kristen has led the creation and launch of the Upend Movement, whose goal is to reimagine a society in which the forcible separation of children from their families is no longer an acceptable solution for families in need. I'm really excited to, to have this, this panel. And so I'd like to open by giving each panelist the opportunity to share more about their work and also to share any responses to this definition of, of carceral system that we just talked about, right? This network of systems that relies on state sanctioned, physical, emotional, spatial, economic, and political violence. Uh, does it ring true? What would you add or subtract? And then for each of the panelists, I know this is a lot, but can you share how physical, emotional, spatial, economic and political violence most often shows up in your area of expertise. So let's let's start with Jody. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, uh, Jason, for this question. Um, I, I absolutely think that the carceral system applies to ICE and um, the Department of Homeland Security. Nationally, 70% of people detained um, in immigration prison are detained in privately owned detention centers. Just with two contracts alone, the US government in 2017 spent $319 million to detain immigrants in the United States. Immigrants, most of whom are seeking asylum at our borders in legal ways, in legal mechanisms. So I think um, the, the process of the carceral system leading to economic, political, social, and racial injustice is, a, is at nature, at its foundation, meant to detain and, and humiliate individuals who are um, in need of protection. 
So I agree with um, the statement um, related to abolition and ICE. Yeah, Leah? Yeah, thanks for having me also. Hello, everyone. I, I totally am on board with that. I will also add to the definition, right? Um, I think the banner said carceral state. I, I also think there's a carceral state of mind or a carceral mindset. And so that like even beyond, um, you know, prisons and police and systems and what exists, I think that what we are finding even now in 2020, when we have, uh, you know, modern times and some creative thinking that many people, um, including well-meaning liberals, cannot wrap their minds around something else um, beyond what we already have. And, and I think that that's part of why even the word abolition is so scary and people, you know, need to play semantics and do, you know, some chipping away and, and really get us to where we are, which is we need something different, some alternative to, to the status quo. Um, and I think history history is a, is a guide um, that something completely new and, and reimagined. So I would just add um, that in addition to the, the state, there is a, I think a, a mindset and a state of mind that that even in my work, right, like every day I am challenged to not accept, like, why am I accepting, right, like, why this assumption or this underlying premise? So I'm looking forward to the to the conversation, and thanks for grounding us in some some terms and definitions. Yeah, Kristen, what do you think about this definition and, and how it shows up in your work? Sure, and um, thanks uh, as well for having me. I'm very excited to be here and be in conversation with these wonderful folks. Um, and so a couple of things. One, I just, some, I started my, my career as an attorney working in the system, really thinking I could do reform work. I never had a client over the age of 18. And I just, uh, and I worked in child welfare, juvenile justice. I worked within these systems, really truly believing I could do reform. And, um, and then when I left the system, the direct service work, which I did love wholeheartedly, but when I left it to, cause I had burnt out and feel, felt very ineffective to come and take a step back and do more qualitative work. Um, so I do a lot of qualitative work, talking to families um, and unpacking why systems are organized the way they are and still produce the results that they produce and that those results despite even some best intentions, um, hurt people more. The, 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 and that's where, to me, the carceral um, system definition just feels so right because it is violence. That systems um, who are, that are operating as they are intended to operate are also intending violence. Um, they are inflicting violence. Yeah, thank you. Derica, can you talk about this this definition and, and how you see it in your work? Yes, 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 of course. I was trying to think about the example that I talked about in the opening remarks about George Floyd and how he was initially stopped for allegedly using or trying to use a counterfeit $20 bill. And just thinking about the economic violence of George, that happened against George Floyd in the first place, right? The economic violence that creates the conditions for police contact, it brings up what happened with Eric Garner. So Eric Garner is on a, a street selling loose cigarettes while, when he's stopped by Daniel Pantaleo and ultimately you know, choked to death. And so the what, what I typically find is that for people who are vulnerable to violence, to state sanctioned violence, have already experienced one type of violence against them before it happens, right? And so I think it's so important that abolitionists, particularly black abolitionists, have a racial, economic, gender, immigrant, like we have to have multi, like intersecting analyses because you can uh, reduce police, right? But if you're not reducing the conditions in which bring together police and people who they're ultimately violent against, you can risk replicating the system that you're trying to entrench. So it shows up all of all of the time, all of like everywhere, unfortunately, because the the way in which this country was created was based on violence. And a lot of the same practices, I'm so happy Leah brought up history because 
when you study the history and the origins of prisons and police, that violence, there has been no break in that violence. There's been lots of continuity. And wherever we see um, this continuity, it's not because a practice has stopped. It's because it's expanded to incorporate and be violent against more people. Right. So I think I, I think the definition is great. It's very, very nuanced, especially this, at least in part, it does a lot of good work right there because it's true. Um, yeah. And it shows up a lot of different ways, unfortunately. Yeah, wonderful. Thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, so I guess we'll, we'll start off with just Jody, can you tell us from from your research? What can you tell us about the magnitude of the problems of immigrants who are being detained and incarcerated and also the resulting harm, not just for the people that are being detained, but also for their children and extended families, like we saw with with Derricka sharing in, in her story? Yes, yes, I, I absolutely can. I agree with Derricka. It, it's not an accident that we detain so many people. It, it's part of a systemic problem in which we've elected to do that, to, to, to present our message. Um, for example, in 2019, we detained 69,550 unaccompanied children through the Office of Refugee and Resettlement. We like to say that we put them in shelters but in reality, we put them in detention centers because they can't leave and they're surrounded oftentimes by barbed wire fences. The majority of these children are looking to reunify with family who are in the United States or they're escaping violence and extreme poverty or in their own countries. And we receive these children by putting them in detention centers, sometimes for three and four and five and six months before we reunify them with their families. This is this trauma accumulates the already very difficult experiences they've faced in their countries of origin, escaping gangs and in the migration journey where, where many of these children have faced very extreme trauma. And 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 then and then we we release them only to participate in a broken immigration system that has them waiting five and six and seven years for what they perceive as a fair trial, but they're not guaranteed an attorney to go with to that fair trial. So we put these children on trial with no attorneys to defend for themselves. And that's not a system that's trauma informed. And that's not a system that's child friendly. And to me, that's that's a very purposeful statement. It's a very it's a similar statement that Donald Trump made with his zero tolerance policy when he separated children from their parents at the border. That is state sponsored violence. Right. That was purposeful. We don't want you here and we don't even want you to use the legal mechanisms that we have in place for you to seek legal authorization and to the United States. So I just, I want to be clear that the detention of these children, the detention of these families is very purposeful and it's, and it's, and it's not the right decision um, for the benefit of children and families. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for that. I, I think Kristen, can you talk more about um, the, the article that you wrote recently with Dean Detloff about how black children have been overrepresented in the child welfare system for more than 50 years. And yet, despite decades of, of work to try and address this, um, they, they remain overrepresented in foster care at a rate nearly double their proportion in the general child population. So can you talk about the, the origins and impact of that racial disproportionality and also the harms posed not only to black but also native communities as a result? Sure, and um, this is where Derricka was saying it's important to know history and to think about history. Um, and I'll go through it very quickly, but I just I do want folks to think about that that the so-called child welfare or now family regulation system, better called family regulation system, was originally never designed for Black or Native children. It actually excluded Black and Native children. And that it really wasn't until the 1800s that even um, that white children were considered vulnerable. Black children were enslaved uh, in the 1800s um, for most of the 1800s, and Native children were considered enemies, or um, you know, I'm going to put in air quotes, but savages, right? And and um, so that the treatment um, in this country of who is a child and who is sort of precious or to be helped 
is different, is racialized in our, in our country's uh, history and in the origins of child welfare. But I also wanted to say that, that um, white, white vulnerable children, they were, um, they were separated from their parents um, poor parents, parents who were considered to be alcoholic, they were uh, in high numbers, and that these in, in the 1800s, 1900s, and that they were put in orphanages and on orphan trains out into the West um, to basically be labor, and that many of those children in orphanages and or orphan trains, like upwards of 40 percent, had parents, but parents who were poor and they didn't have help. So the organizing intervention. Um, is about separation. It is not about preservation, supporting families, ensuring that all families have what they need to thrive. And then um, really for Native children, it was about, um, and, and Black children, but Native children in particular, domination and destruction, whether it's through disease, through taking, through forced relocation, but then really kidnapping and putting children in boarding schools and to eliminate and assimilate, eliminate culture and assimilate. And that harm is generational harm to tribes and to identity. Uh, and But similarly, that this incredible harm to, to Black children through the terror of um, slavery and destruction of family. And then once the emancipation occurred, there were no systems of support um, that were government funded or supported. It was separate and segregated support systems, um, if there were any. But it was really around the 1960s then, and I'm, I'm really skipping ahead here, but with um, government funding to support family, if you're going to support families, you have to, through, th through welfare benefits, you need to, families have to be suitable. And then they sort of look in to see who is a suitable family and who isn't, and these invisible parenting standards really started to take hold. But money was attached to, um, you could support a family by removing a child and money was attached to the removal of children and placement in foster care. What, again, what Derek had described. And money then also became about incentivizing adoption. This is shifting a little bit more recently and we can talk about that later, but just sort of getting to the origins of that. But I also want to talk about the origins, of, um, again, back to what Derek was describing in her neighborhood, in a neighborhood that had a highway go through it. In all of my qualitative work, child, when we're looking at racial disproportionality and disparities, there are particular neighborhoods that, where there's this heavy disinvestment, there are environmental toxins, there are failing schools, there's um, food deserts. Um, where the, the bulk of child welfare hotline referrals come from, are where families are hotlined. There is this, um, there's a design here that's happened, and, in, and it, but it's blamed or laid at the foot of individual families as a family failure as opposed to a larger societal failure. So I'll stop there. Yeah, no, thank you. That's, that is it's great context. Um, as we're talking about money and how important and how a lot of this violence is, is incentivized, right? And people are profiting from it. And then it also extracting money from communities through this, this violence. Leah, can you talk about how, uh, talk about your work with the Texas Civil Rights Project? Uh, in a recent interview with Law 360, you mentioned you're working on issues related to bail reform and probation uh, and, and said that they penalize people who don't have access to money and to capital. Can you talk about that with respect to the harm that reverberates through communities as a consequence of the inability for people to afford bail or probation fees? Sure, and, I, and we see this, the economic injustice and the economic violence like throughout, throughout the entire system, not just the criminal legal system, but the child welfare system, I put that in quotes. Um, and, you know, just throughout um, American society in general, but to, to maybe hone in on the question, I think the consequences really are, you know, 
multifold. There, there are consequences to the individual, right? Like the person who is expected to pay bail or has to be incarcerated because they, you know, because they can't have bail. There's a consequence to the families, right? In terms of family separation um, and the destabilizing nature of losing parents, but also losing income um, and childcare. And then there is, I think the consequence to, and it's the question that you asked, right? The, the consequence to the community and the harms to the to the community. And so maybe later we can circle back to some of the, you know, the individual um, and, and family things. But I think sometimes people don't uh, think, first of all, um, let's just define what bail is, like what, what money bail is and how it operates is um, if you get it arrested for a felony arrest, right? You're arrested and you're presumed innocent, um, but you are asked for a, a money amount in order to secure your release. And if you can afford it, um, you can cash out, literally cash out that day. Um, and if you cannot afford it, then, you know, then there are family uh, hardships, individual hardships and hardships to the community. So that's just pretty much the working definition of money bail. What we see are that most people who are even arrested in the first place um, and arrested for felonies are charged with nonviolent drug possession offenses. They are black and brown people who are not accused of being dangerous to anybody. And they come from black and brown and low income communities. And so um, I like, I, you know, there's the theory and the studies and all that, you know what I mean? The stats and stuff like that. But what it means, I appreciated that Derrica made it personal. Um, and so I think that maybe a, a, like it, it would be helpful to understand it like this. Um, I come from I come from a, a you know working class people who don't have a lot of money, but we will pool our money together if a loved one is locked up mm -hmm. and right, and we have to you know my mom would say rob from borrow from Peter to pay Paul, you know like that kind of system, right? So you pool it all together. I also come from people where there's one house, there's my grandmother's house, so that collateral is such and such and such in you know zip code such and such and such. That's the bell. That's the, you know what I mean? That's, that's, that could be college tuition. That could be anything and everything that an entire clan of people, right? Need and might need to, to, to cash in on. And so when we think about harms to communities, it's not just being locked up. And Lord knows there are, you know, harms to being locked up and to having a visit, right? Like I worked as a public defender, um, but I like just being behind bars and having to do those visits, but also doing personal visits to friends behind bars. That's a violent experience, just having a, having a visit. And so I think it comes back to the economic injustice and I kind of liken it to predatory lending. And you can think about equity stripping like that, right? And it's targeting, it's the same people who, um, already have these systems at work, the same people who already were deprived of just basic economic human survival circumstances are the same people who are being arrested, are the same people who are charged with these exorbitant bail amounts, are the same people who don't have, you know, Capital One or, you know, whatever to borrow from, don't have a trust fund, don't have, I barely, I'm a working professional and I barely have the emergency fund that they say you're supposed to have, you know what I mean? Like if you lose your job and blah, 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 how long can you survive? And right. And like, so anyway, uh, so the, the, the consequences are multiple and it's in, in the, the, they are, uh, they affect, they impact way more than just the, the person on the other end of the versus the person who has that criminal case. So I'll just, um, leave it there, but I appreciate you asking about it in terms of the community and the collective, because I also think that that's part of the carceral mindset is to, to, to right, and the law is like one-on-one, one-on-one, on one, and we're not looking at systems or patterns, and everything is the individual, but we in the real world see themes and, and trends, and so thanks for asking about, you know. Yeah, Every, everything is kind of painted as individual, right? The harm is painted at, at, as individual. The accountability, right, is, is painted as individual. Any kind of reparative action is supposedly, if that ends up taking place, is, is painted as directed toward the individual as opposed to looking at this community harm that might be taking place. Um, so, so I'm going to shift uh, over to... Uh, shift over to Derricka because, well, actually, with the exception of Jody, who's a, a social worker, all the rest of you are attorneys. Um, so Leah, Kristen, Derricka, you're all uh, all attorneys. So 
Derek, I'm wondering if you can talk just from, from your lens about how harm is baked into systems from a legal perspective. Uh, and, and more specifically, can you also share about how the law can be used to undo some of the harms and to even reimagine how policies are created? Of course, yeah. I feel like sometimes lawyer is such a bad word that I have to be like, yeah, I know, I know I'm a lawyer. So I went from like being a little kid and wanting to be a lawyer and now I'm a lawyer and I'm like, woo, lawyers give me headaches more than anybody else, Jesus. Um, okay, so how are these systems baked in? Where do even where do you even start? So um, Jason, right before you asked the question, you were explaining how there is so much systemic racism, institutional problems, institutional ways of creating harm. What happens that it becomes individualized. It becomes about what's in a particular person's heart, what's in one person's mind. And this often happens in the conversation of police reform, right? So the structural racism and violence of policing is then reduced to implicit bias or a bad apple, right? And not institutional violence. And then the reforms, a lot of them legal, like pursue those routes of how do we just implicit our bias our way out of all of these issues, right? How do we rid these systems of bad apples? And so when I started doing research about the history of police, sometimes it's captured in this one sentence, which is, you know, police come from slave patrols. The history of slave patrols is so, so fascinating because a lot of our reforms to fix these contemporary policing crises they actually are, they're part of the origins of policing, of the systems that we're trying to fix. Let me give you one example. So diversity is usually one very popular reform that happens in the wake of a police killing. You know, there are over a million police officers. There's like 18,000 law enforcement agencies. They kill about a thousand people every year. Many more people are assaulted, threatened, intimidated, surveilled. Like those, we don't even have numbers of the people who survive. But okay, so diversity, if we can just get these police officers to reflect the communities that they come from, more black officers, like it will reduce some of this violence. There have been black police officers since the 1800s, since the 1800s. And not only were there black police officers since the 1800s, there were multiracial formations of people who were sent to go and retrieve runaway slaves. So we've had diverse slave patrols and did not make people less safe because the function of the of the system was problematic. Not just that it wasn't diverse, the job was bad. And so diversity just catches me so off guard now understanding this history like, wow, we can look back. There were black overseers. Right. It, the, 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 it feels almost oxymoronic to say out loud that there were black and Native Americans like slave patrols who were tasked to do this, right? But then when you divorce the contemporary problems, the contemporary systemic issues of violence and say, we just need to try this thing, you ignore all the ways that it's been retrenched in the system. It's been baked into the system and it's something we have to fight against. And so we have to ask deeper, more systemic questions about the purpose of these systems. And it's not about needing one particular cop to like not be racist, even though it would be nice to have cops who are not racist. It would be great. I'm not against non-racist cops or anti-racist. It's not that. The issue is that regardless of how nice a police officer is, how anti-racist they are, how many viral videos they have doing the Dougie or what y'all in Texas was South Dallas sweat or whatever the Texas dances are. It doesn't matter how many of those videos go viral. At the end of the day, police officers lock up tens of millions of people. They make tens of millions of arrests. And guess what? Most of the people who are arrested and rearrested, they have incomes of less than $10,000. They're facing mental health crises. They're homeless, right? They're immigrants. They're being policed. I remember being in college and learning about SB 1070, which was the Senate bill in Arizona, the Do I Look Illegal bill. So this is when Sheriff Joe Arpaio is like at the peak of his career. He's on tour because he has rounded up a group of police officers and white vigilantes to go and track people who they perceive to be undocumented. This is in 2006, 2000. No, not 2000, 2009. Yeah, 2009, 2010, this is happening. And again, it comes from a longer history of 
who was able to police the border of this country? Well, as the poor white people living in border towns who needed jobs. And what they were sent to do, they were sent to destroy, kill, break up native families, Mexican families. It's the history is so robust and it's all there. And so it's, I, I always laugh about this because contrary to police, at least I don't hear this. I, I rarely hear it. We should just have more diverse ICE um, officers because it would sound as absurd to say, oh, we just need more brown people deporting other brown and black people. But somehow with police who are like ICE for other kinds of people, it's like, we just need some black cops, guys. It's the analysis is so shallow. And unfortunately it's deadly. Like the analysis is deadly. Um, Paul Butler is a legal scholar he wrote this book called Chokehold. And he has this paragraph where he says, if you're a black person, pray to God that you're pulled over by a white cop because you're probably going to be experiencing levels of violence significantly greater if you're pulled over by a black cop. Right. So this is like we need that deep level of analysis, that deep level of political education. And I can't remember who said, you know, often well-meaning liberals go and they try to do the right thing, but they actually cause more harm. One thing I always tell law students is that it's not enough to be a good lawyer. And for everyone, it's not enough just to go and do the right thing, right? Because it's with, without having a deep political analysis around these structures that recreate the problems that we're fighting, you can then go and represent your client in the way that retrenches the system and make it harder for other people to get their people free. And so it's it's not enough. And what do I mean by political education or a deep political analysis of these structures? And so for a long time, I thought that my ideas were good. I just thought that I knew how to fix things. I care about people. I have a good heart. Easy. This is this is so so easy, right? But no, that's wrong. <laughs> it's wrong. What I had to do was study systems like capitalism. Right. I had to study racial capitalism. I had to read lots and lots of people who thought like more or less than I did, more progressive than I did. And I couldn't do that alone. I had to do that with other people because contrary to being a student where it's about you getting the right answer, building and developing a political analysis is useful because it helps you build conceptual alignment around tackling a problem. It's not about how smart you are. It's not about the grades you get. It's not about the awards that you win. It's not about how many followers you have. It's literally about building conceptual alignment with other people who are doing your work so y'all can get free. So there's so many of these harms baked into the systems. And more important, I think, and I'll finish here, more important than learning about these harms is learning about the legacies and histories and practices of resistance. Because as long as these systems have been created, they didn't, they weren't created out of nowhere. We don't have police because we just needed people to stop crime. We have police because people who were enslaved constantly rebelled against slavery. They constantly ran away. They set fires. They poisoned people. They hid their children. They constantly figure out how to resist oppression. And ultimately, these systems responded to that resistance, right? That's Gerald Horn. Not, yeah, that's Gerald. Y'all know Gerald Horn? Y'all got to know Gerald Horn, right? No, maybe, 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 maybe. He's at University of Houston. So, and, so this is what his work is about, right? This is what Cedric Robinson's work is about. It's about mapping this resistance. Because if you think that we're constantly just responding to oppression, that's actually the inverse. The repression is a response to our will and our desire to get free. Yeah, no, no, thank you. That that was um, that was great. And, and I like how taking us from talking about how these systems are designed to isolate, right? The importance of coming together to develop this political analysis. I'm, I'm curious uh, and I'm interested in hearing from a couple of the panelists from the perspective of the systems that you're familiar with, like what are you seeing and what would you like to see to truly address the societal problems that the, the system purports to address. So Kristen, can you can you talk about that? Sure. Um, and again, this is uh, from a lot of qualitative work. Um, what we're seeing are things, um, I, I don't think what gets out there enough, um, and I want to be careful about how it gets out there, is just the incredible um, 
trauma that families are carrying from their interactions with the child welfare system. And so recently, I just have been doing some qualitative work in a jurisdiction where parents were describing, these were Black parents, describing missing their major milestones in their children's lives because they were being removed. And these children were removed not for these extreme cases that everybody imagines with child welfare, but for cases related to poverty, lack of access to mental health services, lack of access to substance use services. And parents describe missing, um, uh, you know, not being able to breastfeed your child and what that means for you, struggling through them, the depression of all of your kids being gone from you and feeling this weight of the world to fix this. And, so, and, and the incredible isolation that parents feel um, because of that and the incredible um, surveillance. Uh, and it, it, we talked about this earlier, but really, um, I think a lot about a mentor of mine who did a lot of work in domestic violence, talking about a time before domestic violence advocates were mandated reporters. And she described um, sitting around with um, survivors of domestic violence who had come into a shelter and just talking to them and talking to them about um, their stress around parenting, talking to them about their relationships, but how that that relationship fundamentally changed when she became a mandated reporter and needed to report when um, the, the child, when, when she, this kid had met a specific suspicion of violence, domestic violence, and that, that our legal system is set up that exposure to domestic violence um, can be a reason to report a child. And so that helping relationship was fundamentally transformed by our laws. And so that's some of what I'm seeing. I guess some of what gives me life though, what I, I, I um, am excited about is the incredible organizing that parents and advocates across the country are doing. And that, they're, um, and that they're, the, the ideas that are generating the ability to reimagine and also what's happening um, in Indian country about trying to, um, the efforts to restore tribal values and to bring people back and welcome people back into community. And what does that mean? And what does that look like? And I think that that, that uh, it's the organizers, it's the people on the ground that has to be at the forefront, have to be doing the thinking, have to be um, when we're developing laws and centering, you have to center their experiences and write things for them, so it's not a child welfare system; it's a family regulation system. We have to we have to get control of the the language and the narrative to capture the experiences of what people truly are having. Yeah, thank you, thank you, Jody. Can you talk about like what what are you seeing? Uh, what would you like to see, right from from your point of view? And you're muted. Um, I'd like to be clear, and I don't want to mince my words. The way white people dominated black people and slaves is we separated them from their children. That's how we forced submission. The separation of children from their parents is a repetition of that same system. And I would like to see a system where the priority is the family reunification and the unification, keeping families together. I would ask for any system to immediately desist of removing children from their parents, um, in particular in the immigration system where most children are seeking to reunify with their parents. And I would like a system where children don't live in the United States afraid that their parents are going to be deported, where they're going to fear every day that the deportation of their parent will lead to the dissolution of their family. And I'd like to see a system that honors the dignity of all people, that understands that there is severe poverty and violence and environmental disaster, some of which was created by US foreign policy. And I would like to see some recognition of our role in that, and then how we receive the people who have been most affected by it. So I am motivated and I am inspired these days by the threading that I see among activists. So instead of saying, I want to see the abolition of this system, or I want to see the abolition of this system, which sort of separates the focus, I am, I am empowered by the threading of the abolition of all systems that oppress people, including the immigration system, 
the family regulation system and the criminal justice yeah, system. Yeah, thank you, thank you. I, I think it's particularly, I found it important in developing my own political analysis to learn about how all these things are related, right? And, and start to break down these silos to, to talk to people about immigration, to talk to people about education, right? To talk to people about policing, and how do we how do we come together around around all these issues? Leah, can you share what are what are you saying? What what would you like to see? I think I'm two 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 observations and then some related aspirations. And I think the 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 first I think for me is probably the most troublesome. And that is what I think is a divide and conquer pitting against the activists who are saying abolish, divest, defund, do something different, you know, think about something new. And um, the purported, because I'm not, I'm not really sure about this. I know we're not a monolith, but I didn't grow up in a monolithic community either. But the people on the other side who we hear like on the news, they marshal as no, they want more police. Like people in these communities, they want, they actually want more police. And so a lot of times the conversation seems to be right, like I don't, you know, for my reference is always black on black crime or black on black violence, but it, it really is the internal and, and really what it is is we want the same, we want the same thing. It's it's not, first of all, we don't have to settle for so little bit, right? Like we can't actually like, what if what if we had it all? Um, but my point is like I think I grew up in a neighborhood, I think I, I, I said this before, but I'm dating myself a little bit because it's not just it's not just like where you grew up, it's when you know when you were there. So I grew up in the inner city Brooklyn in the 80s and 90s when it was like full fledged war drugs. We were not talking about oh an opioid epidemic. We were speaking about war on drugs. You know what I mean? And and that's how we were operating. And I think that at the same time um, that there were jump outs all the time. At the same time, right? Like I like I remember when I got to Georgetown, it was too quiet. Um, because I didn't realize I grew up around sirens. Like I didn't realize it was the absence. I know I didn't notice the sirens when I was growing up. I noticed the absence of the sirens when I got to like you know up, you know upper Northwest. But in any case, I think the point that I'm trying to make is um, in the same communities that you hear uh, that that are stopped and frisked and you know choked and and you strangle and beat down are are often the same communities where. The, the 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 value of of black life and the value of poor people's lives is no where the police cannot solve crimes against us where the police can't close out cases where you know you have homicides for years and years and years and years that are open and so what what we want is is the same thing we want to be safe without being militarized we want you know without being you know a whole bunch of stuff and so my point is that what I noticed is that uh, the conversation about abolition um, is starting to wear on me because I think it's so so it's easy to have this shallow conversation about no, but the black people want more police actually. So let's shut the you know let's shut the conversation down and and we can go on to something else. So what I would like to see we know better, and I think that that's why I think these personal narratives and anecdotes are important because the law is trained for empirical data, for stats, for proof, for precedent, for can you fit this into that, and and so that's why it's not suited for what organizers and activists need to do, which is move things forward. Um, the law is responsive. It's not, I'm not really sure that it is designed to, to do anything affirmative. Um, and so I would like to see a, a, a more uh, uh, complex conversation and not really, you know, it, where, it, and, and I think a more complex conversation, I think of, among, among the activists and, and the organizers, because I, I don't think, I think these silos are artificial. Um, and like Jody said about like it's all systems, right? And I, I think that there's opportunities for us to break down. Um, there, you know, black immigrants are being deported too. Um, it's not right. It's not just Latinx people. And so like there's there's a room for lots of stuff. Transgender folks can't get can't get no protection, you know. And so there's all sorts of things. And so I, you know, the 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 limitations that I'm observing now, I think, are also opportunities for reimagining and really defining for ourselves you know, something something that we would like like to see. And I actually think that we can agree more on if we take the semantics out of it and don't get tripped up on these words that seem to turn people off. 
um, and only because they're not ready, right? Um, but right, but if you if and just boil it down to like what do what is the world that we want to live in? Like you know, I think we could get somewhere, and I'm encouraged and inspired, and I think you know conversations like this. Um, yeah, this this world building that you're talking about is is so so vital, right? And also creating spaces for these complex and, and nuanced responses. Derica, can you talk about where you're seeing some of this world building take place? Right, who's creating these these complex and um, and, and nuanced responses, and how do we go about building those types of spaces? Right. Of course. I love talking about black on black crime. So if you ever want to talk about black on black crime, it's the thing that I run towards. <laughs> it's the thing that I run towards. Jace, I know it's not your question, but it makes me, I remember feeling the same way, asking the same sets of questions before I understood the politics of abolition. And then I remember like being a new lawyer and organizer and going and working, uh, going back to St. Louis where I'm from, going and work with the communities in Ferguson and talking about um, abolition and being asked what about black on black crime and just being like, oh, so there are people who ask that because because they're genuinely concerned about community-based violence and they're not trying to undermine the politics of abolition, right? And then moving from that to working with community groups around that question, it's yeah, it's a, it can be a conversation ender a lot, but for me, I think it's such a conversation starter. Sometimes I'm on, you know, I'm on panels or I'm in conversations with people and they bring that up that 61% of black people said that they want more black police, I mean, more police officers. And I always am reminded of James Baldwin, who's, who said, I can't remember if this is in the fire next time a report um, from Occupied Territory or a letter from Region Maman or no name, one of his books where he's talking about um, police. And he says that somehow people have conflated the idea that black people want to be safe with black people want more police. And I'm sure if we ask these questions differently, right? It wouldn't be, oh, we need more police. It would be, oh, actually want safety. Like we want to be free. We want our children to thrive, you know? So James Foreman's book, Locking Up Our Own, he talks about this. He says, black people have had so much taken from them. And then when they demanded, we want more education, we want more jobs, we want food, we want shady streets, right? The, the answer has always been, oh, here's police, here's police, here's police. So I talk to people about police being like hot pockets. And if you had a hot pocket, you know how nasty hot pockets are. But it wasn't nasty to me when I was a kid, but as I started to grow up, I was like, why was my mama letting me eat these things? But hot pockets, y'all know, if you cook them, they're a little funny, right? They're frozen in the middle. And then the edges are like lava. And so it's so inconsistent, right? The inconsistency is so bad. And that's kind of how police are in lots of black neighborhoods. The response time is usually very, very, very late or they're always there. The sirens are always on. They're always stopping and frisking you. So there's no right amount of policing. It's always bad. But I will, I, we can talk about this later, but I really, really do love talking about this because I want to help people who are most proximate to that form of violence, like work through the politics of abolition. That's where most of my work is. So that brings me to, to Jason's point. There's so many ways that people are practicing and building a world without having to rely on the car through state. I think some people believe that, you know, the suburbs look like abolition. I don't subscribe to the suburbs looking like abolition because the police are there. They're just facing the other way to keep certain people out. So I, I wouldn't say that's what that work looks like. When I think about the work of Talia Salud in Puerto Rico, who works to de-escalate violence and in, in a particularly extra black part of um, Puerto Rico called Louisa. And what they do is appeal to the people who are involved in different sorts of violent activities or violence, usually to defend themselves. They do everything from letter writing campaigns to going to visit people in the hospitals, asking, you know, to prevent asking for truces, asking, asking for, you know, no more retaliations, bringing families together, using primarily women to de-escalate the violence that's there, refusing to work with police because the communities that they work with do not trust police for lots of reasons. Um, and so when I think about the work of Tyler Salud, it always makes me so excited because Puerto Rico is a colonial territory of the United States. They have the second largest police department after New York City. And guess what? 
all those offices of Puerto Rican. And guess what? Guess who they hurt? Lots of Puerto Ricans who live in Puerto Rico. So it's not enough to have a diverse um, police department, right? Puerto Rico also doesn't have the same non-profit non culture as that exists in the United States. So it's not as if there's a lot of like social services or interventions that people can make to stop and reduce harm, right? So they're really reliant on building deep relationships so right? getting to know people, figuring out, okay, whose child is this? How can we stop this violence? How can we prevent it from happening again? So I always talk about them because I have been so inspired by the work that they're doing. Action St. Louis is another um, organization. They're based in St. Louis and what they do right now, for example, they have a campaign to close the workhouse. And so if you're familiar with St. Louis, St. Louis often gets brought up in the list of black cities where there's black on black violence. It's like Chicago, Newark, you know, at one point it was like Oakland, right? There were all these cities that like come to mind. Baltimore is another one. Baltimore is another city where people are like, oh, ooh, you know, y'all want to defund police in Baltimore. So St. Louis is also has this reputation. And so after St. Louis is building abolitionist campaigns to close jails and to reduce the size and scope of police, while also trying to figure out how do we meet the everyday needs of poor black people in this in this city? Because we believe that's one of the ways to reduce violence. And so I draw a lot. Of, I had I was I am in privilege. I'm privileged to work with, you know, Access St. Louis and go through some of these trainings I was telling you about, right? The what about the black on black crime? What about the murderers? What about the people who commit sexual assault? Because that's that's the kind of questions that we're gonna have to answer if we're gonna get people off the fence and on the side of abolition. And so what Action St. Louis has done is not let not having all of the answers stop them from refusing an oppressive system right now. And they've been successful in closing down one of the jails there. There's a Detroit Justice Center, right? Amanda Alexander, she leads all of these different parts of this organization. And what they do is play offense, defense, and dream. And so they help people who are currently incarcerated by trying to close jails, trying to free people, bail people out, clearing tickets, clearing warrants, doing all of that work, also playing offense, suing and litigating against these oppressive systems and dreaming, creating ways for people to imagine, well, if we didn't spend, you know, 300 or what was the number of four, it's like, I don't know, $40 million on this new jail construction, what could we do with that money instead? And having people think of different ways to build that budget. So there's so many different examples of this across the country. And that's where I draw a lot of my inspiration from. So I would hope that the one thing that people can definitely do is join organizations. It's, that's where you have to build your political analysis. It, Robin D.G. Kelly, one of my favorite historians, he calls us and he tells us to love, study, and struggle. And so by joining organizations and building your conceptual analysis is going to help you figure out where do you plug in. And it doesn't put you in a position where you're trying to get answers to questions about abolition in 140 characters on Twitter. Like it's forcing you to actually read long texts. It's forcing you to ask questions in, in spaces that are safe with comrades and people who will work with you and help guide your analysis. And then where you also get to push people. And so I always tell people that we get to decide what that future is going to look like. Like we get to determine that it's not one expert, it's not one lawyer, it's not one. So it's we get to decide that, including you, right, including the person who's asking the question. And so it's so, so, so important that people just, you know, join organizations. And there, there's so many different kind of organizations to join. Um, this is the last thing I'll say, because Leah brought up Georgetown and Northwest. So when I first moved to D.C., I moved to Southeast and I was listening to this um this um, NPR station. And it's so weird saying that Southeast is a black part of DC because DC used to be black, but Southeast is the more blacker part of DC, right? So I was listening to NPR and they said that between Southeast DC and Northwest, which is more white and affluent, there's often a 10 degree difference, a 10 degree difference in temperature in those neighborhoods. And one of the main reasons why is because there are more trees planted in more affluent areas, right? And so if you know anything about heat and climate change, global warming, you know that heat triggers violence. It treats, like my, even my grandmother used to say, it was getting hot outside. That would mean that they expected exactly hot summers, they expected the violence to increase. And so we have a 10 degree difference. So 78 degrees to 68 degrees is 
definitely a big difference, right? One way, one abolitionist response to potentially offsetting violence, it could be planting more trees, making sure that people who live in black and brown neighborhoods, especially poor neighborhoods, can have lower air conditioning bills because there are more trees there, right? There's so many ways, like get in where you fit in. There's so many ways to figure out how to do that work. So it doesn't all have to be that you're joining a bail campaign, even though you should join bail campaigns. But if you are into environmental work, if you're into religion there, go ahead, Leah, there's so much work to do. So much. Yes. No, I, I was going to jump in on the environmental, the environmental stuff, right? Because like, I didn't, I didn't think about the tree stuff, but I, I know that uh, it's hot uh, in the inner cities because the brown fields and all the polluters and the ozone and all that kind of stuff. But in terms of like, you know, I think something that is helpful and something that I'm learning also in like this new position is like, you know, these strange bedfellows and it's not just preaching to the choir and sometimes, right? Like this other stuff. But I think that like yeah. prisons are toxic, right? There's, you know, like, you know, and we're, we're toxic to the people inside, but also like when you think about the environmental harm that prisons do. Right. There is like there is. And so when we talk about like if we take heat, for example, there are um, like the the lack of clean air and water on the inside. And I can speak for Texas prisons. Texas had to be sued over and over and over again because they don't have ventilators and no air conditioning. And it's the South yada yada. Um, but to to the point about like the conversation and us not being a monolith, my mom is also a correction officer in New York, right? Think Rikers Island. And so sometimes when we think about prisons um, and we're, we're thinking about like, right, there's room for even the most conservative person among us. Sometimes we're thinking, I knew what my grandfather would have said, what's, what you call that? Don't commit the crime if, you know, if you can't do the time. And that's another individual way of thinking about it, but you're not thinking about the workers, right? And so like sometimes the appeal of this conversation has nothing to do with the, the so-called, you know, offenders and the people that committed crime. It has to do with, for working inside the carceral state is that's that's working class work like if you had educational opportunities my mom i'm sure would have chose something different but a ged you know provides this category of opportunities and actually civic service right has been a, a, the way a lot of immigrants and a lot of people have moved up and gotten benefits and paid for georgetown and things like that but um, when we step outside of like the individual, right? And we start really thinking about the community and it's not just like, oh, the black community, or, but like the, you know, where, where are they dumping and the sewage? Um, and I, you know, I used to work in Louisiana and Angola. Good Lord, I mean, that is a slave plantation. They have a working plantation at Angola with a working farm. Um, but you think about like like the sewage and if you know you know if you know anything about like and so like if you are a climate activist if you care about clean air if you clean care about water if you care about budgets if you are a fiscal conservative you know what i mean a tea party republican that wants to see our money used a certain kind of way then i think that that there is probably more for you on the abolition table than there is on any you know any other conversation um that i've seen so i'm sorry to interrupt i really just wanted to jump in on the environmental harm of it because it's not, you know, once we step out of ourselves, I think that's part of the work is be, being less so, you know, less self-centered. And then it's not just about me and my kids. It's also about your kids, too. And then it's not just about my neighbors, you know, and we extrapolate out. It's like mm, our planet is falling apart. Like, so while our planet is falling apart and I'm getting alerts from the from the weather people talking about ride your bike today because the ozone is bad and. Right? Like, is, do, do we need all these dumpers? Like, do we need all these? And so I'm going to stop. I'm going to stop there. But connecting those dots and these, the, the common thread, right, which often is, is about uh, economic injustice. And oftentimes, I think in, in this millennium, um, environmental injustice increasingly. And, and now the last point that I will say is that I'm I said I said there was another thing, but this really is my last thing. Um, 
as the like so i learned like i grew up thinking the inner city was a bad thing because i was from the inner city right and was labeled an at-risk youth but this is this is what it is and during segregation times we weren't allowed to live on the coast you want to live on the beachfront you want to live on the coast you know what i mean you want to have that now nah, but the climate is changing and the inner city is where you need to be that's what's driving gentrification that's what's driving is you know what i mean like the 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 so the it's the inner city that it has the real estate value now and how you see policing operate is policing is retooling to protect the gentrifiers, right? And to push out the people like me who are natives um, and to push us out and, and, and right? Um, so it's a, it's a policing for displacement and it's a policing to protect the gentrifiers, but it's, it's, it's driven by climate change and the more hurricanes and stuff at the coast. I don't know what's happening in the West Coast. I never lived there. But, you know, the more the climate changes, that's where the inner the inner city does have value. It has real estate value. And we can we can link police and tactics to the climate. So, yeah, no, this is this is incredibly important. I'm, I'm thinking about some of the groups in Houston. So Sunrise Movement Houston is, is has their own series about abolition that they're doing to, to expand awareness among students. Uh, one Houston is pushing to get police out of schools. Many of the school districts in the city, in the, the Houston area have their own individual school districts with their own budgets outside of contracts and agreements that they might have with, with police departments. You have students in, in Fort Bend uh, ISD who are pushing to get police out of schools. And then you also talked about like climate refugees, right? And, and this immigration work that is that is directly connected to this and and also how with gentrification you have some of the some of the neighborhoods that were unpopular before right now are becoming more popular because they haven't been saturated and so you don't they're, they're not flooding in the same way uh, and so just the the patterns you see the houston coalition for equitable development without displacement which is which is thinking about this as well so we have a, a question from from hala ode who's asking what is the first step student-led organizations can do to initiate abolition of police on campus? And so I'll actually pose that question uh, to Kristen. Oh, you know what? I am not, I'm gonna pose it to Derek okay. because I am not the best person for this, but thank you, Jason, for thinking of me. Oh, you're muted, Derek. Okay, so the first step student led orgs can initiate, can do to initiate the abolition of police on campus. Well, oh my gosh, so many steps. Okay, so the first step, I think that you should read this, um, this speech that was transcribed by Russell Rickford, who is a professor at Cornell. And the name of the essay is called The Fallacies of Neoliberal Protest. I think that is a must read for everyone in the world. I think students especially must read it because it's, it, he does such a good job of explaining how the administration is going to use task force and committees and reports and climate surveys to deflate your movement and to deflate your energy around anything progressive. So that's, I would say, find your people who you are thinking about talking about um, getting police off of campus, find them on campus, find them in your community, read that. And then, well, that's a first step. That It feels like an insufficient first step, but it's a very, very, very first step because it's gonna be one of the first pieces as to help build your conceptual alignment. And if you have already read that, I would say talk to students at other campuses who also are part of campaigns to get police off of campus. Um, students at University of Minnesota, I would say they were able to successfully get um, police off of their campuses. Um, there's, student, there's a student movement in Johns Hopkins who's trying to get police off of campus. Um, there is a student movement at Howard, I know at least a couple of years ago that we're working to get police off of campus. There's students at Harvard Law School who are trying to get police off of campus. So there are enough people who are talking about divesting their campuses from police. So read Russell Rickford and then talk to those students. Yeah, I, I love that. Um, I know there was there was a, a piece a while back with Miriam Kaba and, and Eve Ewing where um, she was like, find your, find your people, right? Anything worth doing uh, is, is done with other people. And I think that's incredibly important. I know 
that has been helpful for so much of the work that's happening around Houston is people starting with finding those people and, and coming together. So I think we have, uh, we have an audience question here from, from Elena Gormley. In Chicago, the agency that holds these ORR contracts to imprison children in detention centers is Heartland Alliance, a large nonprofit social service agency which has active relationships um, with every Chicago area uh, bachelor's and master's of social work program. So I'm, I'm going to I'm, I'm going to shift that to kind of thinking about what in which as we're trying as many of us are in these roles where we have to build relationships with uh, we have to build relationships with uh, institutions that we may find problematic, right? Whether it be academia, whether it be policing agencies, or whether we might be mandated reporters, uh, we, we might have to carry out some of this work. I'm also going to tie this into a question from, from Kate Vickery that came in, which is asking about to what degree should, should people who are fierce advocates for their clients like join abolition movements, right? Because they might lose access to the people that they're trying to help if they're seen adversarial to the system. And then how have you seen these partnerships uh, work in practice? Jody, can you talk about that? Yeah, I, I, well, I can talk about how I, how I see it and, and what I do. Um, I, I practice wholeheartedly by my um, code of ethics um, from, as a social worker. And if I am working in an organization that is against my code of ethics as a social worker, I am no longer working in that organization. If they do not support um, my framing for how I, how I deliver social work, I can't, I can't work in that organization. And Jason, you mentioned these organizations you, in, in Chicago. There are similar organizations here in Houston um, that uh, incarcerate and imprison um, children who are immigrating to the United States in search of asylum, right, and family reunification. And several deans and directors of social work programs have, have, have stepped up and, and made a point to say, well, we're not gonna train social workers to, to, to work in those systems because those systems by default are oppressive and they go against our code of ethics. And I think that's a really hard decision um, to make because some of those organizations do have kids' interests at heart, perhaps um, in a benevolent way, but in, in a systemic way, it's, it's not, it's not effective to partner with those organizations. And one last point that I have to make is, you know, I do a lot of testifying in court as 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 an expert and for individuals seeking asylum. And really what I'm doing is I'm talking about the in, impact of collective trauma and and migration on on their well-being and mental health. And I worry that my abolition work will be used against me. Um, but it's really going to be used against the people that I'm trying to, to help. And I just have to say that, like, I, it hasn't happened yet. Um, a, a, t attorneys haven't framed it in that way. So I haven't, I think, to some extent, that can just be a false dichotomy. It's like the fear of the oppressive system keeping us quiet because I've still been able to be really effective advocate for my client and still do abolition work because I don't believe in the mission and vision of ICE. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for that. Um, Can I think we, Chris, right yeah, go ahead. Yeah. So um, I, I think a lot about um, some of the folks who um, inspire me, who I don't necessarily think they would call themselves abolitionists, but maybe um, part of the resistance um, and that they get, um, they get money from the federal government, from child welfare agencies, but they are um, about reducing the surveillance of child welfare agencies. They're about reducing the harm of family separation and they are constantly challenging. And so I, th I do think a lot about my lawyer friends and colleagues who um, are doing a lot at the sort of what we call the front door, preventing families from coming into the child welfare system, fighting every single case, filing in every single case. And when families are deep in, filing every single case and bringing it up on appeal for termination of parental rights, not just sort of um, encouraging their clients to settle. 
And, um, and but also this experimentation, I think that is happening where it is about um, doing lawyering around uh, what we would say is the, the, the basic needs that all families should already have in this country, but making sure that they're, they're safe and affordable housing, making sure if, pow if power or utilities gets cut off, that that's not a reason for your child to be removed, but that there's legal advocacy that is happening. Um, that they often are working with social workers who are organized to keep families together and make and bring in as uh, much support as possible to prevent this deep end. So again, I don't necessarily think they would call themselves or even see themselves as abolitionists, but I do see them as part of the road to abolition and, and really lessening this coercive system um, and the removal um, that happens. Yeah, thank you. This this is really hitting for me as I think about our education systems and, and children in schools where we're seeing a lot of hardening going on as, as there's greater and greater fear of, of school shootings and, and other violence that, that may take place and how so much of, of the investment is not going into, you know, the social and emotional learning and, and resources and supports that the children need, especially during this pandemic, but, but just into more of these carceral systems and police and uh, and surveillance and so on. So, uh, so yeah, I'm, I'm hoping that more people get get on board with this. We have another question from the from the audience from Troy Harden, which says, "Kristen spoke to the idea of the struggle with reform, and I believe alluded to the debate concerning working within the system and outside the system, whereas many BIPOC folks rely on employment from the state and seek to change the system from within." From any of your views, is this ever possible? This changing the state within, uh, from within, and if so, how? And if not, how can we create new systems? And so I, I'll actually pose that I think to um, to Leah. Thanks, Jason. You know, of course, I'm going to say it's possible. I. I, I don't know if I have it all mapped out already, but I, I think it's possible. I appreciate the question, and I think it. I think Jason might have uh, pitched to me a little bit because I alluded to the fact that my mom, um, that my mom is a correction officer, but also I was a public defender, right? And so my employment um, relied on the carceral state, right? Like the like in order for my job to exist there had to be a carceral state. In order for my mom's job to exist, there had to be a carceral state. I do think that there's opportunities here the, the same way there's opportunities, like when you start speaking to black police officers and hundred blacks in law enforcement, you start thinking about like, well, what is your, what was your interest when you took this job? You know, like what, what like what was it? And you find out a lot of times, like at least for, and I'm, I'm, I'm gonna speak about my, my personal experience. I'm not gonna extrapolate out for everybody, but it is literally, um, not just even economic mobility, but economic security and the benefits, the health benefits. It's funny that we're talking about this, like while um, the Affordable Care Act is gonna come up in a little while, but the, the health insurance benefits that come from employment with the state or the county or the, do you know what I mean? Like civic employment. And at least for us, those health benefits, like being able to get off Medicaid and actually, even though the city, the city health insurance was just a step up, um, it was, it was a step up from um, from Medicaid and it was important to my family. I think though, what we see is like, if you take the Rikers campaign, right? Shut down, shut down, right? Shut down Rikers, abolish Rikers. What you see is there were many people who worked, correction officers who worked day in and day out who supported that movement. And when you look at the demographic, you find out that they're women, they're women of color. They are often immigrant women, women from, um, you know, at least for, for this specific one, women from West Indian Caribbean backgrounds. And so it is not true. Like I, I've often heard like politicians say, um, like this benevolent kind of, we gotta have jails and prisons and police and stuff because we wouldn't have employment. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like we wouldn't have employment for these people. But the question is, why can't we live in a world where, where we actually have proper employment, living wages, you know, health insurance that doesn't rely on a carceral state? And so I think it is, I do think it's possible. And I think that like, um, looking spotting spotting these these fake screens like these fake side like you could be both like you could you know what i mean you can be an abolitionist and like 
be a public defender working in a system that exists or be a correction. There's like the two things can exist. You know what I mean? Can I, I can grow up like I've, I've seen many people be shot and killed. I've seen somebody decapitate. I've seen it like I'm 42 years old and I still I still see it at nighttime. Right. And at the same time, at the same time, I'm triggered when I when I you know, when I'm driving and there's a there's a police car behind me. And so I think that there is room for many things to be true at one time. And I think the question, um, I think part of the possibilities, part of the way we can create new systems is looking at it from a budget perspective, take it out of the carceral state and just for a functioning city, a functioning municipality, what are our priorities? What do we care about? And, and look at it from there. And I think oftentimes we might be able to, my mom might rather be a 611 dispatcher than be inside Rikers hot, being a woman subjected to all kinds of stuff, being a black person, a black woman subjected to, you know, racism from the other officers. And so it's about alternatives, not just for people in prison, but alternatives for the prison workers too, and living wages and connecting those dots to workers' rights, right? And, you know, why she can't breathe, she's asthmatic. What about COVID, et cetera, et cetera. And so like, I think especially for impacted communities, those lines are so fluid. We have been, victims, you know what I mean, and offenders, and you know, we're law enforcers and we're law recipients. And so I think that these communities actually understand the nuances because we've been living it for generations and generations. And so part of there's probably already some conversations and like some models for for what's um what's possible. But I'm 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 glad to ask the question because it really is it really is about classes. This is a working class issue and if we if we have more respect for workers um, and for people who are really just trying to feed their families. My mom didn't aspire to buy a house. She still doesn't have a house. Like it's not about a car or fancy things. It's literally a single mom with some kids and trying to do something different, you know, than, than she basic, right? <laughs> basic um, at much, at much risk. And so thank you for the, thank you for the question. And if it's not possible today, then I, I say like, you gotta make it, <laughs> you gotta make it, create the conditions so that it's a possibility, you know, tomorrow. Yeah, yeah, I, I love that. Um, and I love that you, you highlighted uh, not just your experience as a public defender, but your mother, because we're thinking about you know, in this moment, especially during this pandemic, where so much of that is concentrated in our jails and prisons. And that's not limited to the people that are that are detained there, right? The prison workers are people who are also placed at risk. And we don't want any of these people to die. Uh, it's also, I think Dr. Gilmore last time said, we don't want police officers to be unemployed, the people who are officers to be unemployed. We don't want them without a job or, or, or without a home. We want them to have other jobs, right? And in, in, in these communities that we can create. Uh, what if we have them all as, as reading specialists? Derrica, can, can you talk to that question about, yeah, can, can you just speak to that question a bit? Um, yeah, sure. Um, I can I can certain certainly try. Um, so actually, on Monday, I have an essay that's going to be published that speaks to part of this question. So if it's okay, can I read a section from the essay? Yeah, I can tell me if it's good or not. Because if it's not good, I got to take it out the essay and work on it over the weekend. But this is this is what I was saying in response to that question. Um, well, I have a longer response, but the more the more direct response is here. Uh, where is it? Okay, so here. Mommy. Oh, <laughs> sorry, my child just broke into my room. Mommy. Yes, baby. Mommy. You have to leave. So I have to finish this up. Okay. But are you all for sending messages? To <laughs> okay. Mommy. Okay. This is beautiful. Okay, go just send baby. I'll see you later. <laughs> Maybe that was a sign that I should not read this actually, but okay, so I'll read it now. <laughs> so I give, just for some quick context, I am talking about Audre Lorde and the famous quote that everyone says, which is the master's tools cannot dismantle the master's house, right? And so I said, we should actually pay attention to the, the full quote, which is more compelling, which is, for the master's tools will never dismantle the master's house. 
They may allow us temporarily to beat him at his own game, but they will never enable us to bring about genuine change. And this fact is only threatening to women who still define the master's house as their sole source of support. So in that quote, Audre Lorde is criticizing white feminists who keep calling on her to be the black representative to explain the intersections of race and gender and class. But I stretch that quote out to and talk about the carceral state. And I say that the criminal legal system is like the master's house. Reforms are the master's tools. Sometimes black people will be able to use a tool or two to get their client free or even appear to be in charge of the house. But this will never bring about genuine change. The master's house is on fire. And the more that we try to reform and diversify and resource it, the more people will suffer as it collapses. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. was right to fear that he was integrating Black people into a burning house. And so do I think that it's possible for people to make changes within the system, for people to temporarily get their people free? Absolutely. I'm a lawyer. I'm still a lawyer. I pay D.C. $700 every year because I, I have decided to continue to be a lawyer. Do I think that is going to provide temporary relief to people from suffering? Absolutely. Do I think that is going to change the system? Absolutely not. I, I, I do not think it's, it's going to, to change the system. And so one reason why I don't think it's going to change the system is related to one of the earlier questions that you had. These harms are not just simply baked into the system. The system is the harm. The system is harmful, right? So it's not about taking the harm out of the system. The system is inherently violent. So without the harm, there is no system, right? It's, it's, it's not about that. So I do think that is absolutely important that people try to figure out that within the constraints of where they are, what can they do to temporarily relieve the suffering of the people that are responsible for shepherding? But I don't think it's possible to change the system. And that's ultimately why I became an abolitionist. Do I think when Lori, and I'm so happy Leah brought up this point about politicians, I'm gonna say their names because it's, they, they don't mind saying it to the New York Times and so it's public. So when the black gay mayor of Chicago, Lori Lightfoot, don't roll your eyes, Leah, you know what I'm talking about. So when she says, look, being a police officer is the only way that black and brown officers can reach the middle class. You want to, no one who wants to defund the police ever talks about that. And I'm like, Lori, yes, we do. We just want them, we don't want them to have jobs predicated on killing, surveilling, harassing, stopping and frisking other black and brown people. So what you're doing is preserving this violent institution because it's a jobs program. We can pay them to do other things. Like it's okay. You have the money. The the, the Chicago Police Department has the money to move it out of the department and pay them do other things, right? And so this is, it's really, really sad, especially again with this history of why people become police officers. L like you perfectly laid it out, it's due to the economic constraints. When you, the high school where I went to, there were constantly police recruiters there, military recruiters there, because they depend on people's poverty and desperation to give them a job. Imagine if people didn't have to choose a job out of poverty or out of desperation. What would people choose to be, right? Even the some of the earliest Black police officers, some of them became police officers because they wanted to protect their Black communities from KKK and white vigilante violence. Now, guess what happened when they became police officers? They couldn't even have the power to arrest white people. They can only arrest other Black people. And that continues today. Right. So it's it's so, so, so unfortunate that the way that racial capitalism manifests in society, it creates the conditions not only for people to be exploited, but then for people like them to move up through helping that exploitation. And that is the system that I'm against. So that doesn't mean that all the Black people need to go and quit their jobs this weekend. So I, I'm, I'm not saying that that needs to happen because we absolutely need public defenders. I don't think we need police, but we absolutely need public defenders because right now there's someone who's going to be charged with a crime and that person needs to be defended, right? So I think that for some professions, absolutely. For other professions, I am not sold. Um, someone asked me, can you share what that will be published? Yes. So... 
Um, Colin Kaepernick, the football player who was ousted and blackballed by the NFL, asked about 30 writers, organizers, lawyers, abolitionists to, to launch this series on abolition. And every week there's gonna be like seven essays that come out that talk about like the relationship between abolition and some other like system. And so the next week, my essay is about the tension between reform and abolition. So hopefully it can unpack more of what I wasn't able to answer right now. That is is beautiful. I am so excited for this, uh, the, the Abolition for the People project. I think this reflection on- Yes, that's, that's, on thank you, Dr. Yes, it's yes, I'm, I'm excited. I saw, the, I saw the lineup. I'm like, this is this is an, an amazing lineup. Um, so yeah, I think this reflection on on Audre Lorde's words, right, which which are thrown out really often, but I think deserve greater, greater interrogation. Uh, and also shifting into how do we how do we still continue to build community, right? This these types of works, right? The this uh, series that Colin Kaepernick is putting together, noting that this is somebody that a lot of people have galvanized around, uh, and and that he's using this platform for this uh, is especially important, right? Bring get your people, bring them together to read to read these essays and to read these works and to build their their political analysis and also their their political imagination, right? So I, I want to say thank you to all of the panelists. Thank you so much to everyone who's been who's been watching. This is amazing. And I'm going to pass it off to Dean Detlow. Well, thank you. Thank you, Jason. Thank you for your exceptional moderating skills. Thank you, Derica, for being with us today. We really appreciate you joining us and sharing your story and sharing all of your um, wisdom about this movement. Um, and thank you to each of our panelists, to Jody, to Kristen, and to Leah. Thank you for being part of our event today. Um, and thanks to all of you who joined us today. Um, I hope you'll continue to share your thoughts about today's event on your social media channels. Continue to engage with us using our hashtag, SocialJusticeUH. I'd also like to thank our incredible staff, Renia Butler, Connie Warren, everyone in our communications department who helped put this event together and make this a success. At the GCSW, we're committed to continuing conversations like this. So I hope you'll stay connected to us. You could follow us on our social media channels, um, take a look at our website, subscribe to our electronic newsletter. And if you're interested in learning more, I hope you'll participate in our next event, um, which is next week, October 20th and 21st. Um, and in this event, we're going to take a deeper dive into the Upend movement. This will be the first national convening of the Upend movement, where we'll be looking at the current movement to end the family regulation system because of the harm it causes to children and families. You heard a lot about that system today and the harm it causes. And if you're in interested in learning more, I hope you'll join us next week. It's a movement that I'm very involved in and one that's starting to have a lot of momentum um, as more and more people come to understand the harm that it causes, um, the harm that the family regulation system causes. So I hope you'll join us for that next week. Thank you all for joining us today. Please continue to share your thoughts and I hope to see you all again next week. Thank you very much. <laughs>